now um, our friend, Ask the Biologist, Dr. Sean Landsman. Um, Sean's here to take me and all of all of you to school every week. We're so happy to have him here. Um, Sean's going to be at the Muskie Odyssey. Sean and I are both presenting on uh, the Ottawa River for the Ottawa chapter. He's also going to be at the uh, um, the Muskie Trader Symposium. And he, if you've, you guys have heard me talk about Project Noble Beast a lot. And in my mind, that's the perfect project that marries um, the importance of research for taking better care of your fish, but it also provides critical information as an angler about behavior. Sean's going to go into that in depth at the uh, Muskie Trader Symposium later on. Can't wait. And uh, I should just be listening at this point when I have people like Sean on. So what are you going to tell us today, Sean? Today, um, we're going to talk about musky spawning and, uh, and early life stage survival and some of the things that, um, that, that can contribute to establishing your, your class strengths uh, in, uh, in muskies. Uh, you know, we all know that muskies are difficult to catch. And um, a, a big part of that is, is because there's just not that many of them out there. And of course, one reason for that is they have kind of varied uh, survival, rates of survival at, at early life stages. They got, uh, they got a lot of things working against them. Um, so, you know, that, that's, you know, one of the reasons why we need to be really careful with how we handle them and, and that when we do pursue them, we do catch them, that we're handling them the best way possible. So definitely if you're interested in, in attending uh, uh, the Musky Odyssey or the Musky Trader event, um, you know, I'll be talking about, um, I'll be talking about proper handling practices. And, and I think we've talked a little bit about that on the program before, but um, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely behooves us all to, to handle them properly because you know they're kind of fragile so um yeah i'm going to talk about that today um yep yeah, there we go thanks lisa all right so you know at this point at least here in ontario what is it uh it's march 1st um we've got probably let's see one two we probably have about another like three months um before they start spawning at least here in eastern ontario um, this is going to vary all across the latitudes of, of the muskies range in terms of when exactly they'd start spawning. So there would be some places down in the south where they're going to get going soon. Um, again, we've got, you know, another few months and then probably in northwest Ontario, Lake of the Woods, that area, it's going to be even a bit longer um, after, after us. So um, nevertheless, I think it's it's a topic worth uh, worth discussing and, and and chatting about. Before we first dive into you know some of the facts about musky spawning, um, it's important to go over uh, a couple of different um, strategies that different fishes use to reproduce. Um, there's primarily two tactics. One is uh, through parental care. Um, so bass, uh, of course, build nests um, and protect their uh, protect their young. Usually, it's the it's it is the male that does the parental care in bass. Uh, same in panfish. So that top photo there uh, is a um, uh, a pumpkin seed and it's guarding its nest. Directly below him is a leaf on the bottom, and you can see some lighter colored objects. Those are its eggs. And so you know we're talking about uh, fish in 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 these kinds of in this kind of category and those that display some level of parental care, typically producing less eggs um, that are of a higher quality. Sharks are also in this category. Um, typically uh, sharks, especially those that give birth to, um, to live young, um, they're, they aren't necessarily protecting the young once they leave the body of the female, but they are investing so much offspring in the in those um, uh, in those individuals uh, that uh, that that there's some degree of parental care there in terms of just allocation of resources, but the other uh, the other category is broadcast spawning, and so this is really widely used by fish all over the world, uh, including most ocean fishes, um, and so that picture there is I think believe that's a uh, 
that's a picture of some kind of snapper, um, but grouper do this as well. Um, and they, they'll form these aggregations and they basically shoot up in the water column and then dis distribute their, in that case, a big cloud of white is milt or sperm. Uh, and then the females will, will release their eggs, all the, the sperm and the eggs mix together, they get fertilized. And then those eggs drift on, on ocean currents to some faraway destination. Um, muskies are, are part of this category of broadcast spawning fishes. Um, so they are, uh, you know, they're, they're typically um, uh, going to be uh, basically swimming along shorelines and depositing their eggs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But muskies are a broadcast spawner. So how do we, how do we actually sex muskies? Um, this is a really actually good way of, of, sexing, of sexing muskies is by looking at the shape of what we call their urogenital opening. So the female there is on the left. This is from a published uh, paper. Um, and the female's there on the left. And she has kind of what's, what's been called a sort of pear-shaped urogenital opening. And the males have more of a key-shaped uh, opening. And so um, especially like in June, they might, the, their urogenital openings might still be a little bit inflamed from uh, the reproductive period from the spawning season. And so it might be a good chance to really see some pronounced differences in their openings. Um, they may get a little more um, blurry, so to speak, as you progress through the, through the season and maybe get into the fall. But usually the male, the male urogenital openings are pretty obvious. So if you were to flip one over, next time you catch a fish, just flip one over and, and, um, and take note. Maybe just grab a picture with your phone and then you can you can take a look back at this presentation since they're all recorded, uh, and take a look at what the uh, uh, what this slide shows you there. So one of the questions that some people sometimes have are spawning um, spawning size and age age for for fish uh, for muskies in particular. Um, muskies first mature around four years of age. Um, the 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 one caveat to that is that their first year or two or even three might not produce fully viable eggs and sperm. Um, and so really when we when we talk about the reproductive potential of muskies, we're typically talking about fish that are six to seven years of age. Um, and around, at least for females, around 31 to 34 inches uh, in length. Of course, with, with males, they would be a lot smaller at that same age. There's what's called a very distinct sexual dimorphism, meaning there's very distinct size differences between females and males. And so females tend to be much larger than, than females. Um, in fact, it would be pretty rare to get a male muskie longer than 48 inches. And of course, we know there's plenty of muskies that get uh, well above 50 inches. And those, so those would all probably be, for the most part, uh, females. But yeah, so about six years of age is when we kind of uh, consider uh, female muskies and, and male muskies to be uh, fully, fully mature at that point. Okay, so in terms of muskie spawning, we, we typically see this occur uh, between 49 and 59 Fahrenheit. So again, sometime, sometime in the spring, that's going to vary uh, in terms of months, uh, depending on, on your location. Uh, typically muskies will pair up, although I have seen them, I've only seen muskies actually spawning uh, once. And that was in Illinois at a lake uh, about 20 minutes from, uh, from where I grew up. And I actually saw three of them. So a menage a trois, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and uh, so, you know, but typically speaking, they, they tend to pair up. They tend to spawn over vegetation. So I just made a note in this picture here. It's one of the best photos I've ever seen of a pair uh, uh, of, of muskies uh, spawning, um, or at least paired up there. Um, but I made a note there that they might not act, be actively spawning since they're moving clearly over rocks and shallow water there. That's not to say they won't drop their eggs uh, just you know wherever they can. Uh, they may very well do that but they tend to prefer vegetation. They also will spawn in very shallow water. So there you can see the, the dorsal fin uh, and, and upper lobe of the caudal fin, especially on that big one on the right, uh, is, is out of the water. And the, the, the three that I saw were in probably a foot or less of water. Um, but they can 
also spawn down to one to two meters, so you know five to six feet. Um, they can use tributaries too if they're available. Um, they will actually go up into tributaries. They'll use back bays especially. Um, so uh, the other uh, a couple other facts here. Um, eggs, the eggs can sink to the bottom, so they're negatively buoyant. They just sink right down to the bottom. And it's thought that they're actually not adhesive. Um, although when I was poking around, there seems to be a little bit of conflicting evidence, um, but it's, it looks like it's generally, they're generally considered to not be adhesive. Um, so in, in other words, the, the coating of the egg itself in some fish species can actually be ad adhesive. So you, those of you may, some of you may know what a smelt is. Uh, smelt have very adhesive eggs. If you've ever caught a smelt in the spring and a female, you get eggs all over your hands. Um, and that's thought to be able to hold that egg uh, in current um, and, and help it hold to vegetation or whatever they may have dropped the, the eggs onto. But muskies are thought to not really have at least much of an adhesive coating, which does have some implications. And I, I'll maybe touch on that in just a minute. Um, yeah, I'll get to the siltation comment there in, in just a second. Um, but I did want to say that, and John kind of alluded to this at the beginning, that this whole period is very stressful for, for fish. Um, it is one of the periods during the year where they experience probably the most, it's probably the period of the year where they experience the most stress naturally in their environment. Um, there's a reason uh, we were seeing lots of fish on the St. Lawrence River dying from viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus during the spring. And part of that is because during this time period, they're allocating a ton of energy uh, to reproduction. And um, they don't have a lot of energy to fight pathogens like viruses or bacterial infections or anything like that. And so they have kind of limited resources available to them to fight off that kind of thing. So um, all told, it is a very stressful period. So you know, if you're out there, uh, maybe you're fishing for pike and, you know, you see some muskies up shallow and the temptation is there to, to fire your husky jerk up in the shallows and maybe try and get one to bite. You might want to just leave the area. Just consider giving them uh, a break. Okay. Um, threats to early life stages. So like I said earlier, muskies are pretty fragile. Um, uh, they have a hard time establishing pretty strong year classes. And, and part of that is due to just susceptibility at early life stages. Um, you know, they're not, they don't display parental care. So they're not investing a ton of energy into their eggs. So their eggs are gonna be pretty small, gonna be a lot of them, but they have to make a lot because they're not of super high quality. They don't have a ton of oils and lipids within the egg that the, that the juveniles can feed off of before they can actually feed with their mouths. Um, the parents aren't around to protect them. So they're at the complete mercy of the environment and what's around them. Um, so there's several things that, that can potentially affect the survival of early life stages. So eggs and yolk sac fry and the juveniles like that little baby one there. Um, destruction of suitable spawning habitat is, it just goes without saying, if you if you have shoreline development and you rip out an, a nice bay or a nice weed bed and uh, to make way for a nice long dock or, you know, dredge out an area to allow, you know, a boat to, to get in and access an area more easily, that is one of the, you know, the most damaging things that you can do, not only to muskies, but kind of any any fish species. Siltation is also a potential concern here. As I said, their eggs are negatively buoyant and they, they don't really have an adhesive coating. So even if there was like some vegetation or, or sticks or something, they might kind of ricochet off that debris and eventually just settle onto the bottom. And the concern there is if there's like lots of wave action or there's been shoreline armoring or shoreline development and you've got lots of silt and wind and wave action and it's pulling in clay off the banks that you just start layering on silt above the eggs and the eggs will need some water circulation to get oxygen into the developing embryo. And if they're starved of that, then they're going to die. 
And so that's a concern. So I see in hatcheries, they have bubblers and they have aerators that are keeping the water moving uh, to prevent. And you, you'll see eggs actually moving around in these containers when they're raising uh, when they're raising muskies. And that's to try and keep that water flowing and get good oxygen supply to the eggs. We also have issues with predation. So, so sunfish are classic uh, egg predators. So things like bluegills and, pan and, uh, and pumpkin seeds, other kinds of sunfish will also eat eggs. Gobies are another known egg predator. That's why there's some concern about their high abundance on the St. Lawrence River being kind of dam potentially damaging to muskie populations on the St. Lawrence River. Then of course, if the, if the muskies are able to hatch, uh, grow from the uh, egg sac fry stage into a free feeding juvenile, they're still not out of the, out of the woods yet. They still have to contend with other bigger muskies, like last year's progeny, uh, pike, including that year's pike, uh, bass, walleye, you name it. Uh, bigger, bigger sunfish, crappie, um, they're fair game for a whole host of, of potential predators. Um, so they, they face a number of different challenges at those early life stages. I just wanted to talk a little bit about pike. Um, and because uh, when we talk about muskies, it's it's hard it's hard to not all and spawning it's hard to not also talk a little bit about pike too. Um, so what we know about pike and their spawning habits is that they tend to spawn a little earlier than muskies. But of course, we know there's hybrid muskies out there, so there's not complete separation of the two spawning seasons. We do know that there is some overlap. And one of the things that, that people have noticed, especially what's going on now in the Kawarthas, and there have been other papers that have, that have documented anecdotal and circumstantial evidence of musky population declines with increasing abundance of pike or an influx of non-native pike into a system. Um, when people see the, those trends occur, one of the things that, one of the theories anyway, or hypotheses, is that the young of the year pike, because they're born earlier, they have a growth advantage. So um, they, you know, they can reach a certain size earlier than a muskie can. And so they may be at a stage where they're able to feed on little baby muskies uh, much earlier than, uh, than, than, than like a, a muskie would be able to feed on on similar sized prey. Um, and so they just have a little bit better growth advantage. And because of that, they, they pose a potential threat to muskies. The other thing is that why white pike tend to hunt in vegetation uh, when they're little. Um, and muskies, if they happen to venture into these weed beds uh, as fry, uh, are vulnerable in these habitats. And uh, so one way that muskies can potentially escape predation is to actually get down into rocks. But if there's not a lot of rock habitat, then they're in a, they're in a tough position there. They better, they better be praying to the musky gods uh, that those pike don't see them if they venture into those weed beds. Uh, but there was a study that actually looked at um, how, how much rocks can actually afford protection for muskies and that pike weren't really able to uh, they didn't. They, were, they didn't find that pike ate a lot of muskies where there was rock habitat. So the, the thinking there is that the muskies actually get down into the crevices between the rocks, and because they're pretty well camouflaged, um, the pike just can't see them, and the, the, that provides some protection for them. So yeah, I just wanted a little to add that uh, little bit of information about pike. And as always, if you have more questions please send them to John or you can email them directly to me and, and there's my email address and you can get a hold of me there. So thanks. Fantastic. Um, as usual, Sean, um, let me ask you about research done on where muskies spawn and do you think that they, is there evidence that they spawn in more than one location? And I'll just preface that question by you work with Dr. Stephen Cook at Carleton. There's more musky research driven out of there than anywhere else. And I know about, a, I think it was a 51 and a half inch fish with a transmitter on it in the downtown Rideau that during the spawning temperatures, they followed and it went distinctly between two locations on the river that were three or four kilometers apart. So um, I've heard that people think 
um, that they spawn in two locations. What do you know about that? Uh, they can. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Um, uh, typically, muskies are known to... I didn't actually mention this in the presentation, but I think I've mentioned this before, that they are faithful to their own spawning. They're, they're faithful to particular spawning locations. Um, and it's possible that that they may sample a couple of different areas or they may spread their eggs out among a couple of different sampling sites or spawning sites. You know, that's not a bad strategy if, if you know, things go to hell in a handbasket in one location, uh, it's, you know, pretty not a bad idea to put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, in one location and distribute them into another spot. So um, it's definitely possible. And there's a 10 year study that you guys are three years into at Carlton right now. Um, an amazing study that's going to be supported through the Muskie Trader fundraiser this spring, um, looking at how muskies use tributaries and I've, I've, I've seen muskies um, during spawning time way up the creeks and way up the tributaries um, you know so more research on how they use tribs if they spawn in there and using the tribs to spawn you know in places like the St. Lawrence where there's a ton of gobies in the main river but the gobies don't know the different water in the tributaries um, that's that's huge research right there, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. In the St. Lawrence, it's a it's a peculiar body of water because they have a lot of spawning habitat available to them. Um, typically, it, it, from my understanding, is they tend to spawn in bays there, but there's no there's no reason why they couldn't just go into a tributary. Um, and I suspect that there's probably, especially in the Ottawa and the Rideau which is what we're, we're going to try and set out to, to determine. Um, I fully expect that, that, that fish are definitely going into those tributaries. It, it, it makes sense for a variety of reasons. So, yeah. Yeah, in the 90s, um, one of the fun projects that Muskies Canada Ottawa guys did was go and look in the, in the creeks, not even the tributary rivers, but way up the creeks for spawning muskies. And, yeah, they weren't that hard to find. So, um, again... Um, great research coming up that's going to help us learn more about muskies, uh, musky behavior and protecting them. So lots of good things going on with you and Dr. Stephen. Thanks for being here as always, Sean. We'll see you Excellent. next week. Happy to be here.